welcome everybody to another edition of Cars Tour today. And if you, in case you didn't see, this is our NHL playoff edition. Go Pens! Yeah, go Pens, exactly. We probably just cursed them, but <laughs> there you go. We got we have support some love here. It's uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, the the Cars Tour colors are black pink. and yellow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We've all got to be Penguins fans here. That's the only team to cheer for. Well, a lot of people don't know that uh, Jack is from Pittsburgh. The guy that owns the series. Really? Hmm, I did not know that. That's in, a fun fact. In fact, he and I uh, are, um, we're from, well, I shouldn't say from, because I'm originally from up around Bristol. Mm -hmm. But he and I, when I lived in Pennsylvania, we lived, like, in the same county. We, he and I actually, I'll even back up, we share the same alma mater. We, we both went to California University of Pennsylvania, which is, like, 20 miles south of the city. There you go. Small world. Small world. It really is. I've met more people I went to college with there or here than I did in Pennsylvania. Exactly. And so. now we're headed to Bristol this weekend. So now what are we going to do? You get to know. see two sides of home. I, I do, technically. Yeah. It'll be exciting. I'm excited. So have you ever been to Bristol? I went to Bristol actually a couple weeks ago with the K&N series. Unfortunately, it got rain shortened. But, man, that place is fast. The high banks. The Coliseum, I mean, I see why they call it the last great Coliseum. It is absolutely outstanding. It was awesome. It's fun. It is. Now, I got spoiled since I grew up there. This is originally from there. See, it's weird. It's like it's where I'm originally from, and then I moved to Pennsylvania, so it's great. Um, so I get spoiled, but it's still special. To me, it's almost like Daytona for me. Mm -hmm. Some people don't want races to Daytona or do something. I, Bristol, to me, is, is that place. And I think a lot of the drivers this weekend feel the same way because they never, ever thought that they would have the opportunity to go to Bristol Absolutely. in anything, much less a late model or a street stock or a compact or a whatever. Um, so I think this is really cool. And I told Chris Ragel this probably about a year and a half ago. I said, Chris, if you do something, a, you, need to, you need a marquee event. You need an event like a Bristol uh, or something like that. And if you go there, here's how you do it. You need to bring in the compacts, the street stocks, the modifieds, the whole deal, mm -hmm. and run late models with it. Well, okay, you know, whatever. Well, he got together with Glenn and RJ at CRA, and they got together with Tim at Southern Super Series. Everybody made everything happen. There are so many people that have to make this thing happen. Like, I think I counted uh, between the various series, there's like 40-some hotel rooms booked just for series officials. That's amazing. There, I mean, there's a lot of people that go into these events, whether it be the race director, whether it be the series owner, from the, the tech guys to the – um, officials and things like that. There's so many people that go into this to make this thing work, and I think this is going to be a fantastic weekend. By the way, we have our first comment oh, on uh, first comment on Facebook. And if you're watching us on Facebook, as many most of you are, um, you can give us your comments in the questions or back up questions in the comments. <laughs> you can tweet to us at Cars Tour. We can put them on the screen, things like that as well. But the first one is uh, when do you get a pay raise for doing such a great job from? Uh, the guy you were bad-mouthing five minutes ago, Mr. Nick Payne. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, Nick <laughs> Payne. That's a great question. I really appreciate that one. You did got to talk to Ray Wall about that one. We'll, we'll have to work on that one. Sounds like fun. Well, tell you what, let's uh, let's talk a little bit of Hickory. Obviously, we went to Hickory uh, a couple of weeks ago. Seems like it's been an eternity now. It really it, has been. It's only I been like. two weeks. Yeah. I guess that whole rain thing in the middle kind of screwed us up. Yeah, just a little bit. And Hickory was a great race. I was super excited to go back. There's so much history in that place just from – racing in the 70s, the 80s, up until now. It's such a historic track. I mean, um, so it's awesome that we get to go back there and race there, and then we had an awesome event there, too. It, the rain kind of messed up qualifying, but other than that, we got it in. We were ready to go racing. We did, and uh, we're going to invert the order a little bit, but the super late model race was uh, was a heck of a show, and it was actually the second race of the night, their, their first duel, but uh, early it looked like it was going to be all Brandon Setzer. Right. Brandon Setzer qualified on the pole for both of the duels. He had a fast uh, number six car and was ready to go. I really thought that he was going to be the dominant car and sweep the duels like he did at Dominion uh, about a month ago. Well, he tried. He tried. <laughs> he tried. He certainly tried. There, there was, it wasn't for a lack of trying. We'll put it to you that way. <laughs> uh, early in that race, one of the biggest stories was that 51 car you see on the screen. Uh, yeah. Cole Rouse qualified, was it second or third, had a fast race car, but – that's about as far as close to the front as he got all night long in the first race. He did. He, f he fell back pretty hard. Um, I know that they were trying to figure out what was going on for the second duel, but I really expected that KBM car to be pretty fast at Hickory, judging by their qualifying efforts and things like that. But here you see uh, Lucas Jones and Raphael Lessard. 
they came back, and uh, that's La Lassard's first race back with us. So we're happy to have him back, and we're glad that he's racing our competitors pretty hard. And he was supposed to be coming to Dominion, but they had issues from a previous race, couldn't get it fixed. Now, this is where things started to get a little, uh, little. well, it was a good race overall, but things started to get really crazy. Tate Fogelman, Brandon Setra, this was ultimately the battle for the race lead. Mm -hmm. Tate ran Brandon down, and all of a sudden, Tate Fogelman was in position within 20 laps of the finish to win his first car super late model tour race. Absolutely. He had went to Caraway the night before and was not able to um, race due to some motor issues, but he came back to Hickory and raced with us, and he, as you see, he's here to the lead. Oh, and here we have contact here. This was one of our major issues here in the super race. Uh, Lassard and Brandon Satchery got Oops. together. Let's do a little bit of a replay right there and see that again. Hit the wrong button, but uh -oh. uh, we'll, we'll back it up. Just, just for the sake of backing it up, we'll back it up. And we have to more. see that again because that was some pretty serious contact there. Well, it was, and we're going to ask Raphael about this whenever he comes up later, but uh, this yep. was the turning point of the race. He did. He drove it in one and two as hard as he possibly can, and Brandon Tetzer was there. You can only lean on the outside car as much as you possibly can. There, there were a lot of comments about that one afterwards. There were. Good, bad, ugly, and different otherwise. I and, can imagine neither were very happy. And Raphael's on the show later. We'll ask him about that incident and more. But that set up this restart with Matt Craig and Tate Fogelman. And Matt Craig, who'd started last, had a horrible first qualifying lap to set his, to set for the field. He got around Tate there in that restart, and it looked like he was checking out. He was. He had just was fresh off a win from Caraway the night before. So he had a lot of momentum going into Hickory. He was hungry for another win and wanted to do that. And right there you can see that he has the car to do that. He's pulling away from Tate on the straightaway, which would catch him a little bit in the corners. But overall, it was a pretty good battle to the end of the race. It really was, and uh, Tate, it wasn't for a lack of trying on Tate's part. I mean, he gave him everything he could without burning it up for the second race. Right. you got to remember, at this point, there was a second race still to come, and you didn't want to burn your stuff up too badly, and that's part of the reason Matt Craig said, heck, I'm going for it. They had thought about saving their stuff for the second race, but uh, you see here, final lap, Matt Craig had about a four-car length advantage. They came to the flag, and Matt Craig picked up his first victory of the year. That was awesome for him to be able to kind of sweep the weekend for him and his team and his crew. Um, like I said, he won at Caraway, he won at Hickory, the first duel, and he was going to be a contender in the second duel. So he had a fast race car all, all weekend. And speaking of the second duel, look at that. Brandon Setzer's on the pole again. There's Matt Craig right there <laughs> on the outside of him. It's almost like we hit the replay button. But exactly. we didn't because Matt Craig, well, it sort of was, just like that restart at the end of the, sec of the first duel, in the second duel, he jumped out to the early lead. Brandon Setzer didn't have a chance to lead that one. And everybody, I think, at least I did at that point, well, this might be the Matt Craig show because mm -hmm. we knew he had a fast race car, uh, but it wasn't the case. That was not the case. Brandon was making a comeback there. He um, was coming with a vengeance. He had a bad wreck in the first duel, and he was like, I'm going to get this win right now. Like, I am not going to let that deter my weekend. And he didn't. He raced Matt Har for the most part, and then uh, – there's these two, remember, they got into it in the first race. You see the damage on Brandon's car, so you know that they're probably thinking, oh, boy, I don't want that to repeat at that point. Exactly. It's like we're seeing double again. It, here we go, going into one and two the exact same way. Uh, Lassard raced them clean going into that one. It was ultimately going to be able to pull off this here in a couple laps. And really, you had four cars capable of winning that race after it all shook out, and there they all four were in the screen. Fogelman, Lassard. Setzer and Craig, and they all played a part in this one. There they are racing two and two apiece, but here's the move that uh, Rafael Lassard was, or well, he starts to work over Matt Craig, I should say, for the race lead. Right. He was he was getting exceptionally close to everybody's bumpers coming out of four, and sometimes you just got to give a little bump to show that you're there, and eventually you're going to make the pass there. As you can see, he's underneath Matt Craig here looking for the lead. Got under him, and Rafael, this is just like he won this race last year. He slowly took his time, made his way forward, and just hugged that yellow line. Worked his way underneath of everybody. New fender and all. Those guys popped on there. Yep. And uh, around Lassard eventually went by Matt Craig and took the race lead. But it was a heck of a race for the top spot. It was. And that was not the end of that. As you can see, Tate Fogelman is right there behind him. He's just patiently waiting for his right move to be able to advance into the lead and hopefully capture a win himself. And he's close. He's very he close. He's close. So we'll fast forward here in a second once we get off of Raphael Lassard trying to get by Matt Craig. Uh, and, again, it just side-by-side side for laps on end. You can look at the ticker and see how long these guys were side-by-side side for the race lead, and that's one of the great things about going to Hickory. Now, there was a yellow flag out there for, I believe, John, John, uh, excuse me, Jeff Batten spun, mm -hmm. which is what ended up ending that one. But on the restart, Raphael got ahead of Matt Craig, 
and that sort of put him in a position for the end of the race where now he was in control of the pace of this one. Right, absolutely. And you see Tate Fogelman underneath Matt Craig as well. They're going to battle it out for uh, several laps. And this is all before the halfway point. I mean, we're right there. We just passed it. But we still got a lot of laps to go. As you see, Dan Speeney, oh, excuse me, Mike Speeney. <laughs> one was of the Speeney brothers. One of the Speeney brothers at, got into some contact there and spun around with Jeff Batten and Nolan Pope, I believe. So. Yep. And that was 33 laps to go. Pope retired for the evening after that one. And uh, Tate Fogelman got around Matt Craig in the course of the racing. So he got the chance to start on the outside of Rafael Lassard. They raced it off into turn number one. But again, Rafael, whatever he figured out in turn one, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that went back, but Right there, that was a that was a moment that Tate Fogelman and Rafael Lissar both, I thought, were going to end up in the concrete. I will completely agree with you on that one. I thought that they were going to just completely take out that and themselves and the rest of the field. But luckily, they both had enough talent to hold it together and keep on racing together. They did, and there was more to come. As if you didn't see the race, the highlights, there was more of that to come. Cody Connor made a good run in that one car. He was a, a contender there for a while in the mid stages and. Here comes the fateful moment we were talking about. Yep, we're going to make a little bit of contact and almost run over, well, did run over <laughs> that left rear there. As you can see, you, there's not even a quarter panel right there on Lassard's car. And then um, we had a tire rub on the number eight of Tate Fogelman there. You'll see some, as you can see, the smoke coming right there. The smoke started to boil, and, and it really kind of started to get a little bit worse. And I think a lot of people were concerned, could the tire last those last 25 laps or so? All the while we're watching that, Cole Rouse starts heading his way forward. He started at the tail after he pulled in uh, from duel number one, so he forfeited his starting spot to make changes to that car, and uh, <laughs> he started moving his way forward, and poor Tate Fogelman's up there with a right front that can probably barely turn because it's got a fender on it. Uh, of course, Raphael's got the same problem. He's got a left rear quarter panel that he doesn't know, and the team doesn't know, is it on anything? Is it just not showing anything? Is there some, some other damage that's been done to this race car? Right. Um, so there are a lot of question marks in those final 10 or 15 laps. I honestly thought we were going to have another restart because you can see the smoke billowing out of his right front from his uh, fender damage. But as you can see, Cole Rouse didn't have the best duel number one, but here he is battling for second, I believe, for duel number two. So he ended up with a pretty good run at the end of the night. He did, ended up getting second there with two laps to go in Tate Fogelman, but it was all about that guy right there at the turn number four. It was all Rafael Lassard, and he made it look easy once he got ahead of Tate Fogelman, but uh, if it weren't for the contact, you, you wonder what could have been, what would have been. It certainly would have been a heck of a race, I'm sure, but uh, the fender folded in at just the right spot, got tucked behind a roll bar just the right way, and Rafael went to victory for the second year in a row at Hickory in the spring race, and... Uh, in his return to the car series. Yeah, that's his fifth career win. That's amazing. And to be the 2016 champion and to come back now, I know they wanted to branch out th this past season and go to several different tracks and get their laps around there. But I'm glad to have him back. He's definitely going to put a good, on, good show on for the rest of the season. He certainly is. And, of course, that was the super race. That was the super race. That was the super race. And then the one everybody was talking about when they left Hickory was the late model stock race. Now, obviously, the super race, as we saw, was, was very good. It was entertaining, well worth your dollar, but uh, if you had to summarize the late model stock race for somebody that didn't see it, Madison, what, how would you summarize it? I, that's a tough question. <laughs> to the first late model stock race, Josh Berry's problem was absolutely devastating, heartbreaking, because it's a local guy. Like, you go to Hickory, you see uh, your local guys like Josh Berry and Lane Riggs and things like that. For him, his motor to blow up and him have such a straightaway lead um, on the rest of the crowd was absolutely devastating. However, his teammate was able to pick up the slack and do whatever he could to win both dual races, Don't which we'll give see. Give it away, yeah. I mean, it, he, he, he was in the contention. We'll put it he to you that was. Way. Junior Motorsports was in contention. In fact, the first duel of the afternoon was the first race of the afternoon for the late mile stocks. And there you said Josh Berry and Austin McDaniel, they were up front. And we'll just be honest, the first 50 some laps of this one, uh, unless you're a Josh Berry fan, grab your pillow because it was not that great at the front of the field. Right. Third place on back was excellent, but Josh had him covered. Yes, Josh had a phenomenally fast car. He was started on the pole for this race. Um, Austin McDaniel did have something for him early on, and I think Austin had a fast car as well. But fast enough is the real question. Josh was absolutely dominant in this first, I don't know, three quarters of the race. Ish, thereabouts. Ish. 
Uh, and everybody got strung out. Now, there was some good racing through the field, as we'll see. There's Brandon Grosso. And one of the other stories we follow was Deke McCaskill in that 08 car. He had a very uncharacteristic qualifying run. Started back in the second half of the field, back about 14th or so. And at this point, he's not even 15 laps into the race, and he has cracked the top 10, working his way around the 23. Um, and I'm sorry, that was Dexter Knight Jr. at Hickory and continuing to work his way forward. And then we also caught wind of Anthony Alfredo in the number eight car. At this point, he's back in about the fourth spot trying to get around Lane Riggs. And I don't think anybody thought that the race would play out the way it did at this point. Not that Anthony didn't have a good car, but uh, he just had nothing for McDaniel at that point, it looked like, either. No, as you can see, the top two leaders are absolutely checked out right now. They're five it's seconds ahead of this group. Exactly. So you thought that it was either going to be Josh Berry or Austin McDaniel, but we've got a battle for third and fourth that ultimately would play out in one of those drivers' favors. It would, and so Alfredo made his way to third with that pass, and that's right at the halfway point, pretty much, lap 36. Uh, so we're just coming up on halfway, and then boom, right here. Nobody expected this. All by his lonesome Josh Berry, and look at this. There's flame, smoke, fire, everything billowing out of that race car. The only thing I don't think I saw were trolls and garden gnomes, <laughs> um, and maybe a couple of monkey wrenches that got thrown out of there too. But uh, Josh bailed out. He was okay, and then it changed the whole race. We have a restart with 19 laps to go. Exactly, and Austin McDaniel gets an excellent jump there. It looks like Anthony didn't get the start that he wanted to, but he was not going to give up there. He was going to dig for a win right there. And I think at this point a lot of us also thought that, yeah, Anthony had a shot at a win, but Austin was so far ahead with Josh that maybe nobody had anything for him. Right. Uh, because we hadn't seen that, hadn't really seen it in the lap times. Deke McCaskill was back there and everybody else. But uh, with about 10 laps to go, Anthony pushed the button. He did. He got underneath Austin and was going to lean on him all the way through the back straightaway into every corner and did whatever it took to get past him. I mean, this was... This, this was race one, remember? Yes, this was only race one, and they stayed side by side until the very last lap of this race. They continue to lean on each other, and in fact, the drivers are back there. Anthony is here to talk with us a little bit later, but they're, they're watching the video, and they're going, oh yeah, look at this, here it comes, here it comes. <laughs> they know what happened, and drivers love racing like this. That's why they love going to Hickory, but as a fan, this was a phenomenal race to watch. Absolutely. I mean, you see them getting making contact there for the win. Sometimes you just got to bump them off the bottom and be able to make the pass, and that's exactly what Anthony had his mindset to do. He got a little bit behind there, but we still have six or five or six laps to go here, so it was not over for him. <laughs> and he was not afraid to use the bumper either. Uh, in victory lane, Austin McDaniel's crew came down, and they had some words for Anthony Alfredo. I won't repeat, um, <laughs> but here, and this is the reason why, coming off turn four, I believe, he laid the bumper to him again. I mean, I don't blame him. I mean, kids, in, mind you, Austin was too. They were both in the boat for their first Cars Tour win. But uh, I think Anthony at this point maybe wanted it a little bit worse. I, I think you're right on that one. I mean, he was running Austin up the track. He was doing whatever it took. Sometimes you just got to go for it. And that's exactly what he did. I mean, as you can see, they're still side by side. We have four laps to go. These guys are driving their hearts out here. Two laps to go. They just took two to go. You can tell by the ticker here. And they're still side by side for the lead. Coming to the white flag, Anthony Alfredo, finally, look at that car, sideways, runs it up the racetrack, kind of hip checks Austin out of the <laughs> way to the white flag, and he cleared him, but it wasn't over because Austin tried to pay back right there, but it was just enough of a slip that there was some breathing room heading to the checkered flag. Absolutely, and that was awesome to see Alfredo get his first car as late model stock win. Um, I know those guys work hard every week in and week out, and to see him be able to win this first duel was absolutely awesome. By the way, your friend Lenny just joined on Facebook. Hello, Lenny. Nice for you to join us. So uh, he's going to be critiquing you, I'm sure. I know. I'm going to get a nice text message yeah, you'll get, later. You'll get a nice text <laughs> message. No, you're doing fine. Uh, but so that was race number one. Race number one of the, uh, of the duels for Hickory, and Anthony Alfredo picked up his first win. Really cool scene in victory lane. I mean, L.W. Miller was there, Kelly Earnhardt Miller was there, the entire, of course, Junior Motorsports crew. And I think everybody expected a Junior Motorsports car maybe to win that race mm -hmm. and expected to be the eight car. Yes. <laughs> it was It was definitely going to be a Josh Berry race, but to be able to have your teammate come out there and get his first car's win is awesome. It, I mean, they absolutely dominated that weekend. They did. And the second race was pretty clean for the most part. We had an incident early, but a couple of the big stories, well, one of them was the fact that uh, Austin McDaniel was up front. Anthony Alfredo was also up front. We're going to fast forward a little bit through some of this. But one of the biggest things 
that came about was Josh Berry. They actually changed the motor in about an hour and 15 minutes. They were putting the hood pins in as the field was coming to the one to go and got him onto the racetrack, started in the tail, and charged his way forward through the field. Absolutely. With, with really no caution flats. No caution. I mean, he We went on lap two. That doesn't really count. That doesn't really. No, it really doesn't because he just absolutely drove his way all, all the way up to the front. As you can see, he's sitting here battling Austin McDaniel, who was in second at this point in time. Um, this, is with 10 laps to, well, this is with 10 laps to go, and this is when the race for the lead picked up again. It is. This was just like the previous race. Austin ran out and led most of the race, and then Anthony with 10 to go once again pushed the button. But I think Austin's crew knew what they had to do, unlike the previous race. Right, exactly. And, I mean, like you said, it's just like the Super Race. It's like we're watching the same exact race over again. The same top two are battling it out with each other. Austin's obviously took what he learned from the first race and going on the bottom <laughs> and trying to use the inside and run Alfredo up on the track here. And this, again, was a great race. We thought the first one was fantastic. <laughs> and then we saw this one. And it was like, okay, we can't get a whole heck of a lot better than that. We didn't think. <laughs> we didn't think, no. But the only thing better would be about four wide doing the same thing. And they tried <laughs> three wide with a lap car right exactly. there. Exactly. But it was just switching back and forth. You know, Anthony would run the inside in one and two. Austin would come back and get back underneath him and run the inside of one, two, and it was just flip flopping back and forth with a little bit of a little bit of an asphalt slide job, if you will. It was a slide job. Yeah. <laughs> Either way you want to <laughs> hang, it was a slide job. So Anthony got by Austin, and then here came Josh Perry. Remember, he started in the tail. At this point, there's four laps to go. Well, three when they cross the line there, and he's reeling everybody in. Where did he come from? He came from the back, and here he is battling with Austin McDaniel for third. New motor, new everything. He was absolutely willing it. And he was not afraid to use the bumper either. No. He thought he could get to Anthony <laughs> and win that race. And he, he, quite frankly, had a legit shot of doing it. Uh, just ran out of time. But that was impressive by itself. Ultimately, it was all Anthony Alfredo. You see the gap he had back to Josh Berry. About five or eight car lengths. And he was able to double up and lock himself in to the U.S. Nationals of Short Track Racing, which is coming up this weekend in Bristol. And Josh Berry, of course, finished second, made it a Junior Motorsports 1-2. But uh, appropriately, Anthony Alfredo is with us. Absolutely. He's going to be joining us here in a bit. But he is locked into Bristol, which is one of the things that you want to be in. There's so much competition coming all across the country to Bristol this weekend. So to be able to have that lock-in spot and race, we will be ready to race. He's good to go. That he will be. Well, we're going to take a quick break. We'll get Anthony Alfredo here momentarily. And then you can ask your questions in the comments on Twitter, etc. cetera. Uh, tweet to us at Cars Tour or put them in the comments wherever you're watching on Facebook, via the Cars Tour page, Race Feed X page, wherever it happens to be. Shoot us your questions. And uh, it's, it's about time to drop the puck, by the way. <laughs> Go Pins. We'll be right back. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back here on Cars Tour today. Trading paint for the lead. That poor car needs to find some clean air. He's trying to make it work, but he keeps giving in the marbles. Come on, Jimmy! The groove's taking rubber pretty good. I think he's sandbagging. He better get after it. That 23 car hooked the corner and dove deep, man. He's running him down. He's running him down. The lead cars are trading paint. He's catching them. He's catching them. Come on, Jimmy. Kick that loud pedal. Woo! It's three cars under a blanket. He's going to thread the needle. He's doing it. He's doing it. Man, they're charging the back marker. He better get around him and find that inside line. There he goes. He's got the lead. It ain't over yet, man. The four stayed tucked under his bumper. Oh, oh, wait. He dumped him. He dumped him. Oh, man, he wanted it up. He's done. He's done. Where's my beer? Dang it, Jimmy. with over 95 years of performance technology leadership. For the difference between a better piston and the best piston, choose Molly Motorsports.
name is Rafael Essor and I'm the 2016 Car Super A model champion, powered by VP Racing Fuel. I am native from Saint Joseph, Quebec, Canada. 2016 was my first year driving a Super A model in the United States, and we will drive to each race from my home in Canada. I got a lot of time looking at the road signs between here and Canada. We ran the entire car store season with David Generation and there was a lot of pressure uh, to perform and to do well. This crew and these cars are some of the best in the business. If you can win here, people know you can get the job done. My crew relies on the VP Racing Fuel to get me the finish line first. I never had to worry about maximum power last year. Raphael Lassart will go to Edelbrock Victory Lane and win the championship in the Car Super Late Mile Tour, powered by VP Racing Fuel. When we added VP Racing Fuel to those Toyota engine, it was a perfect recipe to win races. Every time I hit the gas pedal, she made power. Trust me. I'm really looking forward to see what kind of result I can get again in 2017. VP Spatian is your performance. That's why we use VP Racing Fuel for making power. And you should too. And we're back with Cars Tour today. We have the most recent late model stock winner, Anthony Alfredo. Anthony, thank you guys for coming out tonight. We're going to have some background music with us. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I can only do so many things at once, okay? Yeah, how's it going tonight? It's awesome to have you on after such a dominant weekend. Yeah, it was a really good weekend out there at Hickory. I've always wanted to win there because that was where my first stock car race was. And I've ran a few races there, but I came close to winning, but... Never quite got it, so it was cool to do it twice in a night. And uh, at the end there, my teammate Josh finished second in the second race, so it was neat to have a Junior Motorsports 1-2 finish. Yeah, that was definitely awesome to see. So tell me, walk me through the weekend of Hickory. I mean, you guys qualified pretty decent, um, and then race trim. You had to work your way up there. It was definitely races that you, wins that you had to work hard for, and it was well earned. So kind of walk me through that weekend and how that went for you. Yeah, we had, we had a good car all weekend, actually. I Messed up my qualifying run a little bit, and that cost us a couple spots. We started fifth in the first race and fourth in the second, but since Josh blew up in the first race, we started third. But we had to pass a couple cars. We were running third in the first race, and Josh and the second place car were pretty far out, so we were just going to ride there and probably, if it went green, finish the race there and have more tire left for the second race because they were racing pretty hard. Mm -hmm. And then when Josh's motor went, that group just back up and put us in second on that restart so we were able to fight for the win with the last 15 laps left and uh, we were able to cross line first that first one and I was kind of unsure how the second race would go because we used a lot of tires racing that first race but it was a uh, I mean I guess everyone else used their stuff up just as much as we did because we were still really good and for the tires to drive as good as it did on 150 lap tires as it did on new tires says a lot about the race team and what they're capable of you know with setting up their race cars yeah i know you've got it oh sorry i uh, was gonna say i know you've got a lot of good guys over there that work on your machine so that's pretty awesome Quentin, and this is a it's a comment on uh facebook i should say it's coming in from mike bushy the tech director but we're gonna ask you if you know if this is true but mike says that obviously josh blew up but he says you finished the second race on seven cylinders is that true yeah, that is true. So, so walk us. So, when did you realize that? Uh, we, I definitely felt something in the second race there, and then we kind of, we were, when I really noticed it was after we were fighting because I was so focused on passing. And then we were, or actually, it was in when we when we were in second. And then once we got the lead there, I was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really 100 percent sure what that is, but we're gonna win this race. And after we went through tech and they had uh, checked things out, you know, we noticed that that was the the scenario. But it was pretty cool to actually still win the race like that that could have definitely r made our night uh go south in the second race to go down that same road josh obviously blew up he had engine issues at dominion as well because the, the engine overheated uh, blew up at hickory you had an engine issue at hickory as you've quickly learned that's like traction control there so it probably made you faster <laughs> in a long yeah. ride. but 
now that you know that, it, was that the same problem between both engines, or were they two completely unrelated failures? Uh, they were. They were, from my knowledge, they were separate failures. They were different from each other. Well, th there you go. There you go. So now, with you winning both duels at Hickory, you are now locked in to the Bristol Late Model Stock Race. I mean. That's a big deal. That's a huge deal because there's a lot of competitors coming out there that's going to race against you, and they had to race their way in. So uh, kind of walk me through that. You said you tested the first te practice at Bristol. So how did that go, and what's really your expectations for this weekend? Uh, I'm looking forward to it. We had a really great test there at the, the first open test, and we were fast come the end of the day, one of the fastest cars, and we were actually on old tires. So we were really confident where we'd be at and. um we kind of just, you know, the car was good, and you don't want to run too many laps at Bristol if you don't have to. So we, we called it a day there and went to Hickory, and then to win both those races and get the lock-in spots huge because of how many cars are going to be there. And definitely is a significant benefit going in there as far as the pressure that you feel of the amount of cars there and making the race. Um, but, I mean, we're still going to go there and try to qualify on the pole because you want to start that race up front. You want to start any race up front, but especially that one because there's going to be a lot of momentum there, and it's going to be hard to pass, I think. So it's definitely going to, you know, take some pressure off going into there. But, like like I said, we're still going to, you know, go out there and try to st start up front. Yeah, absolutely. Have you ever raced uh, at a race track as big as Bristol or as big as prestigious as Bristol? No, I've been at a track as as big and as far as length goes as Bristol, but not as fast or anything as uh, you know notorious as Bristol. It's mm -hmm. definitely a neat race track, and I'm really looking forward to racing there. It'd be cool to win that race. It's a huge event, and for it to be the first one, it'd be definitely uh, put you on the map if you could win it. Absolutely, I think so too. How much does that actually change your approach now, having that Hickory deal locking you in? Because there's, I think I, I looked earlier. 58 late model stocks entered. We're going to start 30. There's 58 of them on the entry list. So obviously a good portion of cars and good cars are going to go home. You don't have to worry about the whole qualifying game. How does that change your approach to this weekend? And do you think that's an extra advantage that nobody else has to worry about that you get two days of race practice? I mean, I'm sure you'll make qualifying runs, but it's not like a major concern, I would think. Does that really change how you approach it? Honestly, not really. I mean, like I said before, it, it it takes some pressure off going in knowing that we're going to start that race. But we're going to go about this the same as everyone else, I think. We're going to go make sure we have a fast race car and, you know, probably stick her up, make a couple of mock runs or whatever, and just try to start up front because it's going to be, I think it's going to be really hard to pass since there's so much momentum involved, as far, in a late model stock at least. So you're going to want to be up front because a it's, it's 100 laps, but it's going to go by so fast, I, you know, because how quick it is. And if there's not too many wrecks, it's definitely going to be fast. So you're going to want to be up front because you don't want to have to pass that many cars, especially because it's going to be a challenge to do that. Well, let me, let me ask you this as well, because a couple of questions coming in on Twitter and on Facebook, for that matter, uh, one of which is this one. Now, this is kind of a uh, in jest a little bit, but it is a concern. There, I think it's almost at this point there will be a little bit of moisture during practice especially uh, on Friday and probably maybe at some point late Saturday. So if we shorten practice, how much then does that change your game plan from what everybody else has? And for that matter, what do you guys do in the rain there? Because you don't have the hauler. That's all outside. Everything gets brought in. Uh, it's a very unique situation, but how is that going to affect your priorities going into this weekend as far as what you really focus on? I'm not sure exactly. I just hope we're not in that scenario because I want to get, you know, plenty of, plenty of practice uh, uh, laps in, make sure the car is good, and be able to qualify and race on Sunday. It looks like it's going to rain Friday through Sunday, but hopefully it gets caught up in the mountains out there or something like that. Cause, yeah, uh, Sunday will be good. Yeah. I, having lived there, Sunday will be good. Yeah, I mean, it does change a lot, so hopefully, you know, it'll, it'll miss us or something like that. We'll get some practice laps in. I don't think we'll make that many laps I don't think anyone will because it's going to be there's going to be a ton of cars out there in the first place in practice but also uh you know you don't at a place like Bristol you don't want to make more laps than you have to so we'll go out there just make sure the car is good hopefully the rain doesn't delay us or delay the whole weekend so we'll see how it goes yeah you'll be fine you, you will be absolutely fine another question on Facebook and this is coming from uh one of your competitors or fellow eh, competitive families this comes from Heather Riggs Lane's mother and it's a very good question, and, and I'll be curious because he's not here. He's not here. 
he might be watching me. He's not here. Seeing how you and McDaniel raced in duel one, she asks, would you have put the fender or the bumper to Josh Berry the same way? That's a fantastic question. Thank you, Heather. If it's for the win, yes. <laughs> he would do the same to me. <laughs> well, at least you're honest. Yeah. So, I mean, it's different. Like, uh, it's different to just say. I mean, you're, when you're in that scenario, it's completely different. But, but, I n I know he would to me. So, the team asked me that too. I'm like, well, Josh would do it to me. <laughs> well, there you go. I guess that's fair enough. Sometimes you might be teammates, but you still got to race he, for the win, right? Honestly, as my mentor, he'd probably be like, he'd be happy he'd won. But if if he knew that I was just like didn't try and let him get it, he'd be mad at me. I'm sure. I would hope. Because that's what a mentor should do. <laughs> yeah. At least now your expectations are out in the open. So if it does happen, <laughs> it's not like he wasn't warned. Yeah, no, now he knows. Yeah. We might have to see that at Bristol. We never know. Well, after your wins, you did have another announcement. You are going to be going to UNCC for engineering, I'm assuming? Yes. Awesome. Well, that's awesome. You'll be able to move down here, and then you'll be close to the shop out of Connecticut, down here where all the racing hub is. Yeah, exactly. I've already been spending quite a bit of time down here when I have consecutive races, and to be down here for school will be even better. Just be down here all the time. I mean, no better place for as far as racing goes. Yep, exactly. Well, we are going to wrap this one up. Congratulations on your wins, and we look forward to seeing you hopefully have the same outcome when we go to Bristol this weekend. Thank you. Yeah. We will be back next. We're going to have... Are we going to have Lassard? Yes. Okay. Raphael Lassard is going to be with us. He also won at Hickory, so stay tuned. the same quality and performance the pros depend on when you fill up at VP Racing Fuels. And while you're there, check out VP Maditives, formulated by the mad scientist to give your ride a seat of the pants boost. Visit VPRacingFuels.com for more information. Watch Tudor Championship action on Fox. Check the TV schedule at IMSA.com. VP Racing Fuels is producing the first TV commercial in support of its retail branding program, marking another milestone along VP's path to becoming a global consumer brand. Building on 40 years of success in the race fuel market, VP is converting gas stations and convenience stores across the country to the VP brand. Each store will help build awareness for the VP Racing Fuels brand as well as VP's other products sold there, including VP Small Engine Fuel, Mattative Performance Chemicals, VP Power Wash, and more. The commercial features Sarah Burgess, a professional global rally cross driver, one of the many racers who have come to rely on VP Racing Fuels for power and performance. I'm Sarah Burgess and I'm here in Yukon, Oklahoma, ready to shoot the VP Racing Fuels TV commercial. Action! The commercial introduces viewers to VP's Mad Scientist, a character symbolizing VP's passion for leading technology, making power, and having fun. Okay. Okay. 
So we're on set right now and we're now at the cool part where we're using a lot of the product in the vehicles. VPRacingFuels.com, check it out. The commercial also introduces VP's new tagline, Our passion is your performance, which expresses VP's commitment to the success of both its retail customers and VP's dealers. For more information, visit VPRacingFuels.com. Get the same quality and performance the pros depend on when you fill up at VP Racing Fuels. And while you're there, check out VP Maditives, formulated by the mad scientist to give your ride a seat of the pants boost. Visit VPRacingFuels.com for more information. Watch Tudor Championship action on Fox. Check the TV schedule at IMSA.com. And we're back with Cars Tour today. Now we have another winner from Hickory, Raphael Lassard. Lassard, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? Good. I'm glad that you were able to make it to our show. I know you had some prior dinner, dinner plans, but you're here, and you are a victor in the car series again. Yeah, very happy about it. Absolutely. We're glad to have you back. So you captured one of the super wins in duel number two. You were a contender in duel number one. Tell me about how this past weekend went for you at Hickory. Uh, it went pretty good, but... We had a couple of accidents and something happened with Sedzer and but we came back with the win so it, that's well, what matter. Let's 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 play video analysis here, shall yeah, let's we? Let's go through <laughs> this let's, with the okay. <laughs> Alright, so let's play it we're gonna play at full speed once. Alright, so here you are getting well, driving really hard into turn one and two. Yep, we'll even back and, up a little uh, further. You leaned on them a little bit, so yep. what what happened here? Let's <laughs> let's play it through again. Walk me through it. Uh, the lap before, we can't see it, but he went way up the racetrack, and I thought he was going to do the same thing. So I drove in pretty hard, and it didn't, he didn't do the same thing. So I just, I I was too aggressive and ran into him. So now, at what point did you realize, um, there we go. At what point did you realize here uh, that you were, you were about ready to have an incident? Um, it's more <laughs> in the center of the corner, like. Pretty much right there, because like when I knew I was pretty. I couldn't go lower than that, and I knew it was. I saw that it was coming down a little bit, so I knew it was gonna be clo close, but I <laughs> kind of hit him pretty hard. So yeah. I think we had is. a couple fenders to replace on that one before the second duel. Yeah, we did, but my guys at David Gen Racing did a very good job, and we won the second one, the second duel. So. Yeah. Was pretty happy. Absolutely. You had a pretty good qualifying run. You were able to come up and get good jumps on the restarts and yeah. able to run um, pretty hard with those guys. I know that there was a slight other incident with Tate Fogelman. We yeah. might have a little bit of a... Yeah, we'll, we'll pull that one up in a second. Yeah, yeah. we're going to pull that one up. But you guys were racing hard together. It was side by side, rubbing on each other a little bit, whether you put the front bumper to the back bumper, trying yeah. to get anybody loose off the corner. Um, but that was pretty hard racing between you guys. That was I definitely put on a show for the fans out there. Yeah, but I was trying. I was doing what I have to do. I was. I knew it was a little bit faster, and I was pro protecting the inside a little bit. And I think he might have got tired of it and just moved me out of the way and hit me. But it almost made my car better. So. <laughs> yeah, I was like, you can Wait, see what? there. Yeah. How did it almost make your car better? Because I was <laughs> having some, I was really loose, and then after that, something broke at the back, and it was all, it tied it up. So ha take us through that. How do you save this race car here? Because he has you jacked up. Yeah, but <laughs> I don't know. It happened. You just, I just, I just react. So I saved it, and I'm pretty used to it, so. Yeah, I was going to say, you don't have a, um, left rear quarter panel there anymore and he had a tire rub there so really it was both not a disadvantage but it would definitely created some complications for the rest of that race that was yeah. i 
thought that there was going to have another caution and we were going to have another restart and kind of see something similar. But that wasn't the only good save that you had during that race. Early on, there was one on the back stretch that you got a little squirrely there. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. We will bit. cue that one up, too. Uh, it's yeah. It's band band over here. So just I remember that. Oh, I don't get scared off in the race car, but that time I... Oof. <laughs> Why <laughs> was that so scary? Oh, it was not scary. It was just... I think I stopped breathing for a second or two. A second or two. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, well, here it is. So we'll show show this one. So what happened here? Um, Kind of went up the racetrack. I thought I was going to have a good run of the corner and just. You weren't as clear as you thought you were. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, again, we'll watch this in slow motion. But I, I thought you were about ready to, to firewall deep it there. Yeah. Well, it was pretty close. That was another time that Tate had kind of jacked up the rear end there. And he cut you a big break there, didn't he? Yeah, but I didn't. I didn't leave, and I just tried to be as fast as I can, save it, and come back pretty strong after that. But wow. I know. Well, you have returned to the car store. You've got yourself a win. We're glad to have you back again. Um, we're going to Bristol this weekend. You have tested Bristol and kind of got some laps around there. Tell me how that went and what really your expectations are for this weekend. I know all of the DGR cars are fast and they're ready to go out there. I mean, that's a good organization. Yeah. So tell me about that. Uh, the first lap around there was pretty a lot of fun. It's way different than everywhere else. And it's very fast. But at first, we were, <laughs> we were terrible. Like, the car was not really good. And... My guys during the day at David Yen Racing worked very hard to get better in my Toyota Camry. And it got a lot better at the end, where I think P3, and it was, it was very good at the end. I am, I'm very happy about it, and we'll make s some changes at the shop this week, and I think it's going to be better for this weekend. So I'm we very excited. Madison had mentioned going this route, um, and Heather Riggs, She's always good with this question thing. She's really good with this She's question. on point tonight. She, she is. So I'm going to leave this camera on you here in a second when okay. I get ready to finish this, uh, this question. So one of your sponsors is JBL Audio. Yep. They make some great speakers, some great uh, audio <laughs> equipment. Um, and her question is, after she watches the videos, obviously you guys have cut all these, so you know more than we do. But after watching all the JBL Audio videos with you, Christopher Bell, are you thinking of taking up a second singing career? <laughs> yeah, I thought about it because I saw some guy think I'm very good at it. So <laughs> I might I might try it, but I think I'm going to stick to racing because I like it a lot better. But I think I have B plan. <laughs> plan B. Hey, w whatever, right? Yeah. I know, whatever. Hey, I was going to ask the same thing. I mean, as long as you got your turn for pizza and... <laughs> yeah, that was re very good. You're yeah. singing. And we threw that at Madison for a reason. A, let's go pins, right? What's, what are they? Okay, they're not playing oh, yet. Oh, they're not... Not drop yeah. the puck yet, but let's go pins. Yeah, now Raphael's from Canada. Yep. So, Madison? Well, obviously, we have to ask, do you have a favorite hockey team? I know you used to play a little bit back home, but what is your favorite hockey team? Yeah, I never had one, so I can't really answer that. But I just I don't cheer for any team. I just watch it and kind of like to watch it. But now, what was that thing that you were telling me that you kind of wanted to give Tony a little crap on? <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> Nothing. No, oh, go ahead. No. Go ahead. It's a live show. Go you ahead. gotta do it. Come on. No. He'll love it. I just it I just thought me. about um, the capital. <laughs> just say it. <laughs> Because I'm sure you love Ovechkin. You cannot spell Ovechkin without the same words as choke, or same letters as <laughs> choke. <laughs> now, my Washington Capital friends will probably hate me for that. But, uh, you know, hey, at least the pins are still in the playoffs. I know. Oh, and they still have, well, no offense to you, but at least they still have a hockey team in Pittsburgh unlike Quebec. But if they're, they're in the NHL, that's mean they're all really good. So <laughs> that's it. Well, that, that's that's true. They are, and, and, yeah. and that's the thing. Like I will say, I do. Ovechkin's a very talented player, but as a Penguins fan, it is my duty <laughs> to despise anything Washington Capitals related. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. I mean, we've uh, got that towel. We've got the hat. We've yeah. got the car's colors. The Again, shoes. <laughs> the sock. Well. Everything. 
Don't tell him everything. <laughs> don't tell him everything. Aye, <laughs> Chihuahua. Oh anyway. Gosh. Uh, but in all seriousness, though, I mean, we talked about the Bristol stuff. You've tested the whole deal. Um, have you? I, I know you've run some of these races that have a little bit more of the prestige to them. Um, that have like like a snowball and like some of the stuff with uh, up in uh, Canada, like when Kyle Busch would come up and things like that. But and, and you've also run the ARCA races that maybe weren't on the stage of a Bristol, but does any of that prepare you to go to Bristol and and block out all the, the stuff you see when you walk through that tunnel and you, and you see the, what you're getting ready to do? Yeah, but it's it's always fun to go race there and you just you just have to do like it's another race, like uh, it's a hundred lap race and it's going to be huge, there's going to be a lot of car, but you don't have to put pressure on yourself and you just go and do what you love to do and don't put too much pressure on you and just try to do your best. And I, and I have to ask this question too. I talked to some guys after the last test here this past Saturday and your name came up, but maybe, well, anybody that's watched you race, this is not a surprise. But a lot of people said guys, some guys were what they considered past the zone of comfort out of control. I've watched enough of you to know you're never in a comfort zone. You're always on the edge. You're always sideways. But they said, man, that 99 car was sideways and still fast. How do you get around that place hanging out knowing you're, you're on the edge of control and you're that close to put in the fence? I mean, how, how do you do that? Um, I don't know. I just – that's my – comfort zone like you said it's just I like it like that and I just try to get everything I can get out of the race car and like at Bristol you're almost wide open like in, in with new tire I didn't even touch the brake once and I was getting back on the trail wide open almost everywhere so it's it's a lot of fun I love those track it's like Winchester were kind of a little bit loose and sliding around in practice, but for the race it was really good because we were able to make some pass on the inside. So it's, I think it's we're gonna be very good. Should be, I think should so. Be. There's a big intimidation that comes with Bristol, but then at the same time you have to be on the brink of absolute out of control, control crazy there. But we'll see how it plays out this weekend. Uh, yeah, we we'll see that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys for enjoy or joining us and. Congratulations on your win at Hickory. Hopefully we'll have something for you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yep. Next up, we're going to have one of the newest NASCAR next guys, Chase Purdy. Stay tuned. VP Racing Fuels is producing the first TV commercial in support of its retail branding program, marking another milestone along VP's path to becoming a global consumer brand. Building on 40 years of success in the race fuel market, VP is converting gas stations and convenience stores across the country to the VP brand. Each store will help build awareness for the VP Racing Fuels brand as well as VP's other products sold there, including VP Small Engine Fuel, Mattative Performance Chemicals, VP Power Wash, and more. The commercial features Sarah Burgess, a professional global rally cross driver, one of the many racers who have come to rely on VP Racing Fuels for power and performance. I'm Sarah Burgess and I'm here in Yukon, Oklahoma, ready to shoot the VP Racing Fuels TV commercial. Action! The commercial introduces viewers to VP's Mad Scientist, a character symbolizing VP's passion for leading technology, making power, and having fun. Cut. Yeah, cut. So we're on set right now and we're now at the cool part where we're using a lot of the product in the vehicles. VPRacingFuels.com, check it out. The commercial also introduces VP's new tagline, Our Passion is Your Performance, which expresses VP's commitment to the success of both its retail customers and VP's dealers. For more information, visit VPRacingFuels.com. Get the same quality and performance the pros depend on when you fill up at VP Racing Fuels. And while you're there, check out VP Maditives, formulated by the mad scientist to give your ride a seat of the pants boost.
Visit VPRacingFuels.com for more information. Watch Tudor Championship action on Fox. Check the TV schedule at IMSA.com. clean air. He's trying to make it work, but he keeps giving in the marbles. Come on, Jimmy! The groove's taking rubber pretty good. I think he's sandbagging. He better get after it. That 23 car hooked the corner and dove deep, man. He's running him down. He's running him down. The lead cars are trading paint. He's catching them. He's catching them. Come on, Jimmy. Kick that loud pedal. Woo! It's three cars under a blanket. He's going to thread the needle. He's doing it. He's doing it. Man, they're charging the back marker. He better get around him and find that inside line. There he goes. He's got the lead. It ain't over yet, man. The four stayed tucked under his bumper. Oh, oh, wait. He dumped him. He dumped him. Oh, man, he wanted it up. He's done. He's done. Where's my beer? Dang it, Jimmy. And we're back with Cars Tour today. We are here with Chase Purdy, one of the newest inductees to the NASCAR Next. Congratulations on that, Chase. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's a real honor to be a part of that. And um, it's uh, we're going to do a lot of fun things throughout the year. You get to work and meet with a lot of cool people. So uh, it's, uh, it's going to be cool. Absolutely. And that's uh, all a part of being one of the up-and-coming drivers. You've got a lot of talent. You've got a lot of race wins under your belt and super close race wins that you want to get. Um, so that's awesome to see you guys in there. There's a good class with you guys. But on to more important things is Bristol. <laughs> you got some practice things at Bristol. You got some laps around there. You've had laps around there in a K&N car. Kind of tell me, um, number one, about how your K&N race went there and then how your super test went there. Um, well, we had to start in the back because we didn't have any team owner points from last year because I never ran. So um, that was so kind of a bad st deal. Hold on, stop a second. So explain that. Did you just start the back, or, or why was there a reason you had to start there on points? Because because of the rain, and um, I didn't run last year, so I didn't have any team owner points, and uh, so we started 22nd. Um, we got to 12th, and the rain started pouring down at the halfway break, and we we really didn't get a chance to show what we had. So um, I feel like if we could, we would have been a top five car. But uh, there's a lot that you can always if about a lot of things, but uh, that's just how it happened. And now we're going into a super weekend at Bristol, kind of transitioning from the K&N car to the super. How does that transition work? And then how is the super weekend going? How did your practice go with that? Um, it's uh, it's a big transition because, you know, in the K&N cars, it's um, it's all about momentum. And uh, the supers, you really you can really just drive it off in there and kind of pinch the corner more, and, and it turns better uh, overall. So uh, you really just have to recognize that and remember that when you jump from a super late model to a k and car. Um, Bristol, either way, in both cars, is a very high-paced racetrack. You have to be really smooth and finesse, and um, it's, it's going to be who can stay on the bottom the longest for the race to win. <laughs> who, who in the heck's back there heckling you? I don't there, know. There they go. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like the Lasard gang. Give yeah, me a hard time. I, if, if I had to imagine, it's probably uh, Christian. Uh, oh, all right. Um, uh oh, we have to stop. This is the famous um, question. What are you going to order? That's um, Harrison Burton bringing the menu. To I'm, a, I'm a big cheeseburger fan, so we'll, we'll see what they have. They do have um, good burgers here, by the way. Uh, Just tell let's me what see. You want, then I'll Where, you where's the, uh, where's the cheeseburgers order, at? <laughs> Tony, what is your favorite thing to have here? I like the shrimp, personally. The, the shrimp? Not the chicken? Not the chicken sandwich? No, nah, the chicken sandwich is good. Uh, they do market mm. it as the biggest breast in town because they are huge. But, uh, yeah. Thunder Burger? Yeah, I would say the Thunder Burger, but um, I don't want any um, tomatoes or onions. But with fries, 
This and, is a group um, effort. Yeah, apparently. And a sweet tea to drink. Yeah, How many sweet race tea. car drivers does it take to order <laughs> off of an What do you got? Yeah, the four. Three or yeah, four, that's, easily. That's what I got. I got the Thunder Burger. Uh, I think it's going to be a solid choice. It's thick and juicy. Yeah, thick and juicy in parentheses. Uh, <laughs> not digging that. Um, or, or I'm digging. You could go over to the Thunder Thighs section and get some. Thunder ice Thighs, <laughs> yeah. Thunder <laughs> Thighs, man. Uh, Clearly check they have that out. Here. Yeah, check plenty that out. of choices. Wow. I'm sure. <laughs> oh, man. We won't say that. Yeah, we will not say that. It, it's a little racy here in the menu. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll take the Thunder Burger. Hold the uh, tomatoes and onions with uh, french fries and sweet tea. Thanks, guys. We're good. I'm good. <laughs> I'm going to watch the hockey game after. So I got plenty of time to eat. So uh, they do have a taco special here today, too, by the way. 75 cent tacos. It's not even Tuesday. I know. They do it on Wednesday. Well, that's fancy. That's different. Yeah. So okay. Anyway. anyway. Can we go back to race cars yeah, now? Yeah, we can, Mr. Hamburger. I guess. I guess we can get back to race cars. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, Bristol is such a big track. Um, it's an intimidation factor. It's got so much prestige to it. What really are you expecting going into this weekend? You've got a – like like Raphael, you've got a good group of guys right there behind you that's going to back you and put your card where it needs to be and with the speed and things. Like, how, how is this going to affect this weekend? Um – I really think going into Bristol, uh, this being as big of a super race as it is, and not just for supers, but for the other divisions that are involved. But um, um, some people are compared to the Snowball Derby and it being a bigger race than the Snowball Derby strictly because of how many people enter the race. But um, I think you have to go in with a positive mental mindset. Yeah, I see him back there. <laughs> um, but um, you have to really just – I mean, it's focus on what you feel in your car and not get caught up in, in lap times and, and other things that can be distracting to a driver. I know I'm guilty of being caught up in the lap times, and I think every driver is at some point. So um, I think you just keep focus um, and stay on your toes during the race and uh, keep your nose clean. I have a couple questions for you. One of them, um, and I think you, you are a wide-open type driver. Would, would you think that's a fair assessment that you uh, enjoy speed? That That's fair. That's a fair assessment. How or, or can you even put into words the sensation of speed at Bristol, what it's like to go around there, what it feels like in the car? I mean, how fast is that place, especially in a super late model? Um, it's definitely the fastest super late mall place I've ever been. Um, one thing that you do notice is that when you go off into the corner, it's – the force put on your body, it just feels like it wants to push you through the seat. Like, you you start up here, right, and you get into the corner, and all of a sudden, whoom, just down in the corner. And, and it puts a lot of force on your body, and that's something that's uh, that's new for for me in, in the Super. Like, And that's just something I never really felt in the Super. So um, I think these cars are – you can move around a little bit more. So you can kind of slide all over the place a little bit, so to say. So when you get into the corner and you have that force on you and you're sliding into the corner, it's a little sketchy. But uh, it's uh, it's cool. I, I love it. Now, the next part is we, we asked, um, I think, Anthony, about kind of what the plans are because there's probably going to be a couple of showers through practice. We're, we're probably going to have to deal with a little bit of showers. But we've already been told that they'll run whatever they have to run. If we got to run later at night, we'll run later at night. And some fans, and even for that matter, people have asked, you know, what happens if, if it stays? And A, it's not going to, but if it does, we've been told that they're just going to go to the – we're going to be there until we get it done, period. That, that doesn't – whether it's Sunday night, Monday, whatever, we'll be there until we get it done. So how does that affect what you've got going on mentally, or does it even affect you to have a start and a stop or anything like that on your mind? Um. Really, it, it would uh, it would just kind of remind me of what happened in the K&N race. You know, we, we went green, and then we, we stopped halfway in the race. So, I mean, yeah, from what I'm hearing, we're probably not even going to get the main race in. So, um, you know, initially, um, we might have to wait a little bit longer to get it in. but Might um, be a little bit later that night. Yeah, but um, I think it would be cool to do a, a night race. Like, if the rain holds out, and say it's about 7 o'clock, let's drop the green flag then because I'm going to want to go – racing at night at Bristol that's something that not a lot of people have besides like you know the top guys in NASCAR so um, not even the k and guys they didn't run at night so that would be a neat experience um, the track just looks so cool at night um, on TV I mean it's it's just awesome it really is I mean it's uh, 
we've touched on. I mean, I'm originally from there, but it's 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 a different deal to say the least. So I think that would be cool to see you guys under the lights. Obviously, as whatever it takes to get it in, we're gonna get it in this weekend. Um, so if, if you are watching and you're questioning that, it's gonna get in this weekend. Don't worry. And after looking at some of the the forecasts, it looks like it's gonna be the typical summer pop up shower. You'll get a little bit of stuff in the afternoon. It'll lose the atmospheric energy and we'll be set to go for the evening. So um, that should be a good thing. Right. And, I mean, we kind of saw that at the K&N race where it looked the exact same on the radar and we got a little bit of rain. Enough, but a little bit. So everything's going to be fine. We're going to get this super race in. It's going to be one of the best super races and late bottle stock oh, races that we're going to oh, see. Oh, boy, yeah. Yeah, it'll it'll definitely be fun. Um, I think for, for me and maybe other drivers have this, you know, concern too is – I don't know if y'all know this, but they changed where the finish line is. The the finish line is actually on what would be the back stretch. So when you cross the finish line that's originally put there, you have to remind yourself that's not that's that's not where you are uh, you're gonna start in the race. I was guilty of that on a mock run this past weekend. Um, I uh, I lifted on what I thought was lap two, but was uh, lap uh, lap one and a half, so to say. I never never completed it, but. Uh, that's something that uh, I'm gonna have to tell my spotter to constantly remind me of, and during the race, and uh, eyes open for that. And, and well, everybody always wonders about this. And you guys are going fa the fastest time in practice is a 14:46, which is a tenth faster than the track record that Denny Hamlin has in a Cup car. Wow. So just how easy is it to get lost as to where you're at there? Um, you know, I, I was I was victim of thinking that's a little dumb. Um, but uh, after the Canaan race, I was quickly shown that it's it's really easy because you know both corners may look a little different, but after about a few laps, I mean it's all the same corner at that pace and speed, and and you really just have to remind yourself like when you come down pit road or something like they're both the same, they're set up the same. I mean it's the same. So you may think you're going into turn one, but you're coming into turn three, and, and you really have to remind yourself that, especially now that the finish line is on the back stretch. So now you're going to have to be working what would, to me, feel like the opposite way. Well, and I think, it, and with nobody there in the grandstands, it feels opposite. But I think, and for somebody that hasn't been to Bristol for one of these types of events, they've done this before in the past. Uh, UAR ran there. The ASA, the old ASA Late Model Challenge Series ran there. They've run the, the Frank Kimmel races there. And this is a very common theme when they do these smaller scale races, and everybody's wondering why are they doing that. Simply put, it's easier to get to the grandstands from the back straightaway. You can park back there. It's a lot smoother of an entry into the, into the facility. Um, so it's a lot more fan friendly to do it that way. When you're testing, it's weird because there's nobody in the grandstands. But I think when you get there on race day and the front straightaway is well, what is the back straightaway, but will be the, the late model front straightaway, has all the fans, I think that might make it a little bit easier on you. But if you're curious as to why, why are they doing that, that's exactly why they're doing it, because it's going to make more sense to do it that way. The l previous times they did it, they did just what you said. They seated everybody in the back straightaway, and they still had start-finish at the front, which was kind of goofy. So now they've moved us. They put a loop in over there, and that's so when you're in the car, I don't think you're going to experience it any differently. It's going to feel like one and two to you. Or three yeah. or four or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah, and um, you know the fans are going to be beneficial for us because we're going to see where the finish line is. Because obviously the fans aren't just going to be randomly sitting on the back stretch; they want to be by the line, you know, to see the start and the finish. Um, but you know, at the same time, as a driver, you're not concerned about what's in the stands. Right. Well, I mean, we have a hundred laps, green, hopefully green flag laps to go for this super race, and it's going to be hard side-by-side -side racing the whole entire time. Like you said, a lot of people are going to run the bottom, and you're going to have to boot them off the bottom to be able to make some passes, but the speed around this place is incredible, and the bakes around this place is incredible. I think it's going to put on a pretty good show. Uh, I think so, too. Um, I think that what's going to start is the outside is going to be able to roll pretty well, but uh, after a few laps, that VHT that's down there, once it gets heat, it's heat activated, so after about five or ten laps, I think that bottom's going to be where you need to be. It's going to be straddle the bottom the whole time and um, just turn up underneath them up off the corner. Before we get, before we let you go, um, you brought your buddies with you. Obviously, okay. it takes four of you to order a burger, yeah. which was what we yeah. learned. Um, so, tip, if you're ever behind Chase Purdy in line at a restaurant, you might be there for a while. Um, but you guys have been active on Instagram all day. and You've been active on Twitter, the whole deal. You're all pretty, like, Harrison's back there with the NASCAR Next program. Todd was with you guys. Um, you brought Christian Eckes and Anthony Alfredo's here. 
What do you? I mean, what is that like to run around as a professional race car driver, starting to work your way up, and hang out with other guys of that same caliber? What does the day like that involve? Today, I'm sure it's a little bit different, but what do what do these days involve? And I know people see it and they think it's got to be great, but what all do you actually have to do that people don't see? Um, well, I think what people don't see is, is how much all all of us as drivers put into it. Um, a lot of people think we just show up and we run races, but that's uh, I can totally assure you that's not what the deal is. And uh, personally, it's uh, it surprised me how much goes into it, and um, it's been stressed how much that needs to go into it. And uh, you once you commit, you gotta fully commit. But um, no. Uh, being around these guys, and, and I'm friends with these guys back here. I mean, it's uh, it's a ball when you're outside the racetrack and you're somewhere like, I mean, all we do is just mess around with each other and joke. I mean, it's um, it's it's really fun and uh, it's nice to talk about racing, and, but not have the pressure of performing that day or something. Not that that's bad. Um, I love performing and doing what I do as a professional race car driver, but it's. Um, it's a, it's neat to meet the people that you do meet in this sport and um, who you can be surrounded with and how everybody knows everybody. Um, long story short, um, the lady from uh, Fox Sports 1 on the uh, NASCAR Race Hub, uh, when I first Shannon met Spake. her. Yeah, Shannon Spake. Um, she asked me where I was from. I said, I'm from Meridian, Mississippi. She goes, no way, me too. So I was like, wow, that's awesome. And uh, she goes, your last name's Purdy. I said, yes, ma'am. She goes, is, uh, is your dad a grandfather? Uh a doctor. I was like, uh, actually, my dad is a uh, emergency room physician, and uh, my grandfather is an OBGYN. And um, they're like, "What's his name?" I was like, uh, "James uh, James Purdy." And they were like, "Oh my God, that's that's who delivered me." I was like, <laughs> "Small world." I mean, you don't see that every day, but uh, I just thought that uh, that was pretty cool and uh, fascinating. That uh, that is pretty wild. Yeah, it was pretty random, but uh, I just thought I'd share that. You know, that is small world. The racing world is a small world when you really look at it. It definitely is. Well, like you said, there's a lot of people that go into this. There's You have the drivers, you have the teams, you have the crew guys, everybody that works in the shop that puts all their effort into putting your race car and every other competitor's car to the front, and that's what they want to see, and that's definitely what they want to see at Bristol. Um, with it going into this weekend, hopefully that's what we're going to see from you guys in DGR, but we'll see how that all plays out. Yes, that would be awesome. Uh, if we could have a DGR front row and a DGR 1-2 finish, pretty stout. Now, hold on. Who, who wins? Me, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> theoretically, my number's uh, in front of Ralphie's. So, I mean, I I would hate to mess that up. 97 <laughs> comes before 99. It's a pretty good theory. OCD about your numerical <laughs> Yeah, order. yeah. It's just an OCD thing. Uh, I'm sure timing and scoring would agree. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that works out. It's kind of like one comes before two. You know, you really don't want to mess that up. There's a lot of people that have you picked because this is your style racetrack. Really? That's uh, that's awesome to hear. I, I do love places like this. Um it really fits my driving style. You really got to get up on the wheel and wheel it, so uh, it's cool. Yep, awesome. Well, hopefully you'll be wheeling it into victory lane this weekend at Bristol. Thank you guys for, for joining us, and we hope to see you with many success this season. Thank you, Madison. Thank you, guys. Yep, thank yep. you. Well, that's a wrap for Cars Tour today. We will see you guys at Bristol, and then we will be back soon with round four of Cars Tour today. Say bye, Tony. Bye, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> bye. Thank <laughs> you.